Okay, as we start, this is a beautiful old bowl. It's in the very simple, older style of rose mulling. Um, my first class in rose mulling was with Ailey Salid, and she still painted in the more old style. As you can see, the, the red background is very common in ball dress. And this has a base of scrolls with the S leaves off of the scrolls going upwards into the three flowers with S leaves coming off of that. Uh, this might look more black, but actually it's a deep blue color. And you can see the tulip shapes, especially the ones on the sides, you can see the teardrop that drops off the side um, petals. And also the green leaves are usually a green with a lighter shading on one side. And it, what's really interesting in Valdris is if you look at the lettering, it's a beautiful script, but when you look at the bowl this way, the lettering looks upside down. In Valdris, if you look into the inside, or across the bowl, the lettering looks upside, upside down. Because the way it was read was if you took the bowl in your hands and turned looking downward at the lettering and turned around the rim. Okay. This is the side of the bowl, which is very simple, no decoration, except the beads are painted and contrasting colors. And again, if you look across, you can see the lettering looks upside down. Okay. This is another bowl, again, in that older um, style by Ola Berga. And he was one of the most famous um, Valdris painters. And you can really see the S-shaped leaves here in the blues where it's dark on one side and light on the other. This is a symmetrical design, but you can see the four tulips um, balanced in there and the round flower in the center, which is almost painted sort of pinwheel. Um, like, and the very center of it uses dots. Often centers of flowers were, um, had teardrops or dots to accentuate them. And also again, you can see the lettering, it looks upside down and it's a red background. Okay, next one. This is the sides where here the lettering looks right side up. And this bowl was carved, so it's just a simple um, acanthus carving that is painted in reds and greens, it looks like. Okay. This is an ombar, again, the red background. So a lot of red in ball dress and the blues in the flowers and the greens. You can see the blue S leaves that are off of the stems on the lid. You can see um, green line work that almost makes a um, S shaped leaf. What's interesting on these flowers, it looks like that pinwheel type of flower, but yet they took a dark line and made a point on the end of the flower and added teardrops. So it's a little different. Okay. This, these show the sides from different directions. And you can see the green bands, which are a very good contrast to the red because they're opposites on the color wheel. And this is a thin space. So there are uh, very thin S leaves to fill with the little flower or swirl in the center. And what's interesting on this, I had asked Jennifer about this, because if you look at the foot on the left there, you can see the three little circles and dots um, kind of incised in there. And I asked Jennifer it was, if it was an 
uh, like the wood burning type of design. And you can see it also on the other parts of the sides on the top and the lower edge. And you had said they often painted over this, right, Jennifer? Yeah, that's correct. So the the ambar is probably much uh, well, probably much older than than the painting on it. And so yes, it has some spheticor or burnt decoration underneath that has just been um, uh, remodeled now with with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we can go on. This shows the very side, which has again on the. Um, on the, oh, whatever you call it. I for, forget the spouted edges or the sides there. It has a flower and leafy um, leaves that go off and blue leaves at the bottom also. So it was decorated all, all through. And on the edges, on the sides, even though they are not physically connected, the design flows because they, come together where the points, um, if you see the S leaves, they point towards each other, okay? This is another ombre and I thought this almost looks like it was painted recently just because of the, um, the clearness of the paint and all. Again, a red background, the handle is probably a dark blue trim. Um, there's the oval with cross hatching and dots, which is a common element of Valdris. You can see the green S shaped leaves, um, little teardrops and details coming off of the flowers. And they have stems that come from the center underneath the um, handle, okay? Here's the sides, and again, you can see a band is painted in a different color, a contrast, um, a small design on the edges, okay? This is, again, continuing around, so you can see the design, the S leaves. And what I love on this is right above where the peg is on the top side, there's a simple flower more in line work that's drawn around it to um, accentuate or flow with that area, okay? This is a detail of the end, and you can see the simple gold S stroke with some teardrops and then just teardrops that decorate the side, but it works well with the piece, okay? This is another Valdris, which I think it's painted more crudely, um, but again, it has the greens and the reds on the red background. If you look, there's sort of a scroll at the base, and usually that would continue in a very slight S stroke up to the main flower. And then the other flowers and S leaves flow off of it. And these are very simply painted roses. And if you notice the cadmium red dots, often in Valdris, you found just touches of cadmium red, like in dots. And also these flowers, if you look at them, they seem to be pointing towards the stem line rather than how we think in nature, how um, flowers droop over which again, another common thing in Valdris, okay? These are the sides, beautiful script lettering around the edges, okay? And this is just a little detail between the lacing. And when you have lacing and there's a space, you should put a little design in there. And this one, they just added the little green leaves to it. And one of the other things about um, Valdres is the greens. Before I started in Valdres, I was used to more olivey greens, not so bright. 
but in Valdres, we often use green earth, which is a much brighter green. And that's okay in Valdres. So, okay. This is a Tina, which to me, the design of it really reminds me of Us also with the handle at the top. But again, the red background, it has the sort of acanthus, rococo around the edges. Rococo was very common in Baldris also. The simple round flowers around the handles and beautiful lettering in the date and initials. Again, the red background, okay? These are the sides, which uh, to me was, I was kind of like, is this Baldris? Because the one on the right has leaves that almost look like ooze. Um, same on the left, uh, I see it's from Telemark also. So could be just someone who had a lot of influence from different styles also. But yet, um, it has the green leaves, the reds, the round flowers. Um, I think that large red flower is supposed to be a rose, but I'm not quite sure. Okay. Here you can see the ends. And even though the design does not quite physically touch the uh, pin part or the handle, uh, the side edge, I guess I should say, um, goes down a ways. And there's enough design that's close enough to those edges that it works. And also what's nice on this is see that on the bottom, they continued that dark blue line all the way around the bottom that kind of carries through with the line and the details on the lid. Okay. This is a lovely trunk. Now here we finally get a different color background. It's green but yet you can see the reds and the greens and the yellows in there, the red scrolls. When you're thinking of a color, always think of opposites on the color wheel. Again, the green background, so the red scrolls. And if you see on these scrolls, the scrolls are the base of the design on the front. And there's numerous, it's supposed to be leaves that are following that scroll. And then there's a stem going up and you can see the S leaves, the green and the yellow coming up out of the center of the scroll area. And you see a round flower, you see flowers on the side and beautiful lettering again. Um, I like how they kind of put the date in the front, kind of squeezed it in there, but it really looks nice, okay? These are the ends of it. And even though they are basically the same thing, the painter just painted them and you can see their slight differences. Like the top on the left has multiple red leaves where there's not as many on the opposite side. The lead, red leaves coming from the bottom upwards on the left, they have more details. On the right, they're just very simple. So it's symmetrical, but not exact. Okay. And this is the lid, which is a little different. I don't know if the background was really a different color or no, it looks like it was still the green, but yet the front has the red scrolls and this has the green scrolls, not as much red. I think I would have painted the scrolls red again to go with the designs on the front, but you can see the multiple um, leaves off of the scrolls, the S leaves on the top, the round flowers, and so on, okay? This is a really interesting trunk. I I've seen this down at Westerheim, and if you get a chance, go and look at it close up because you can see 
where it was painted over. And this was done by Ola Berga again, probably the first time. And if you look at the design on the right, I like that design much better, but it's the flowers coming out of the S leaves, the S stroke um, stem to a cluster of flowers on the top and tulips and clusters of small flowers. It's just a beautiful design. On the left, you'll see the roses. Very center is a rose that's almost tilted kind of sideways because you can see the dots that are in the center part of the rose or stamens like. And if you look at the little roses on the between the red strokes, you'll see that they're painting painted towards the center, tilting that way. You can't see the leaves as much because it's dark, but you can still see that there's S leaves. And again, beautiful script lettering, okay? And here, the top, you can't really, again, so often the tops were so worn, but you can see how this was a flower made out of scroll or a strokes to um, make it into one flower. And the center is a dark area that has cross hatching and dots. And often centers were just a circle of color, but yet adding dots or teardrops or cross hatching to emphasize it. Okay. This is another which uses mostly reds. I believe there's some blue in there. But it's, again, the red scrolls. Monochromatic is the key to Volger scrolls. Um, usually, they were either Rococo or more of a solid color like this. The thing that's different in this one, if you notice, there's dark blue scrolls that are kind of at the base of the red scroll, which is a little unusual. I haven't really seen that a lot in Valdris. And again, the roses where they're painting downward, the roses are more of the center of a flower where there's petals around it. Okay. Here's the ends. I love the end on this. I think it is just gorgeous with just simple reds and line work. The way the flower, it makes flower shape around that handle. And then the leafy shapes coming upwards from the bottom. And the edge was painted red all the way around again as a trim. And then at the top, it almost has a Hollingdale feel in some of the borders, but it's the blues where there's strokes and a little bit of opposite direction in the teardrops, but it's just a beautiful painting on the side, I think. Okay. Here is the top, which almost looks more detailed than the rest of the painting. And this one is actually in very good condition. You can see the blue is a little stronger, which again, in Valdris, I've not really seen that much where there's blue scrolls along with the main scroll. You can also see some blue scrolls at the top. But again, the clusters of flowers, the center with the petals around it, um, a lot of details, little small um, flowers, the cross hatching in there. And there are some of the more S-shaped leaves too, okay? This is a beautiful front. It's too bad the top is so worn off. Basically, all you can see are the red tulips. But this one, if you see, are the green scrolls. They're all greens. And then the stem is a little straight. Usually it had a slight S, but it goes up to the large red tulip. Tulips were very common. And then smaller flowers. And then on the sides, there's also some tiny flowers. So you want to vary again, the size of your flowers, okay? 
This is a beautiful trunk and very distinct. Again, here's the red, which is red and blue are probably my favorite for baldras. But here's the leaves and they start at the bottom and come upwards. There's three flowers. And here you can see the slight S between those two large green leaves. And again, the green leaves where they're green, a little light on one side and dark on the other. You can do that without shading. Often it was done that way, just a stroke of green at a light colored line and a black line. Um, one of the things I really like was the way the lettering and the dates fit in underneath. And they added a little design to fill in that space there. Okay. Here's the top, again, the green scrolls. And in the very center, you see that rose, which again looks upside down because it's hanging. I don't know if the idea was to have it hang over, droop over towards you, but you can definitely see the white of the ball part and then the teardrops and dots in the center. A large green tulip, which to me, I think it's a little overpowering because size always matters too when you're doing a design. And then the outside edges are almost like three separate designs. There's a scroll with some flowers, a scroll with some flowers, a scroll with some flowers. So it doesn't really flow as nicely. The way it's connected is that black S-stroke between the C's, okay? Here's the end, which is very nice. It's very clear, um, just simple green strokes, and then the black line work made the details to them, okay? I had Andrew put this in. This is from Nils book on Valdris, and that's what I have studied more than anything as far as Valdris. And this again is Olaberga, and it's probably one of the most famous pictures of Valdris that you can find. But again, it's beautiful with the red background. It's more of an off-white that's been antiqued with the blue. In the panels, you can see the chinoiserie, the dark blue groundwork in trees. And if you notice on the bottom, the flowers grow from a base of leaves where there's a stem into a cluster of flowers. Now on the top, it's in the upper portion. So if you notice there are swags or ropes, which the flowers are hanging from. And generally in Valdris, we say things have to be either potted, planted or hung. They need to be connected some way. And all, if you look at the center panel on the door, you can see the three, two or three flowers and the roses that are pointing inward again. Okay. This is Peter Adnes, which is, I loved his work. And this is more who I've modeled a lot of my painting off of, but it's, Again, this is a blue background. And if you notice the rope, it has a swag above the handle and then also a long swag around the outside of the handle. So it has flowers hanging in the middle and then flowers at the bottom. And his uh, S-strokes, if you notice, are very distinct. He has small... Uh, clusters of leaves also, and they're just beautiful. I've, I've taken that, um, I use a flower very much. If you look on the right, that red flower in the center of that cluster, I've done things like that. I've gotten a lot of ideas from his painting, but it's just a beautiful painting, okay? 
And this is another of Peter Adnes's from the book, um, Migration of a Tradition. I believe that was between Norway and Westerheim. But you can see the panel there has the Rococo um, scroll work at the bottom. And then there's a vase. This one shows that the flowers are all coming from a vase. It has some beautiful roses. And if you notice the parrot tulip, the white, and numerous clusters of leaves. To me, the white kind of sticks out more than anything else. If you look at the overall picture on the left, you can see the white. That's what draws your eye. So I think there should have been a little more white, but still, he has just some gorgeous work. Okay. Now, these are newer ones. This is Claudine Schatz, who I think of her as a Hollingdahl painter. Um, I can really see the Hollingdahl influence there on the flowers. Uh, she does have the little S to the leaves. Um, anyways, this is her interpretation of Aldris. Okay. The sides, which are very simple with lettering and the different colors in the bands. Okay. This is Sheila Stillen. Um, she was another painter I took from years and years ago when I first started in Baldris. And she paints in acrylic, but she didn't have all the mediums that a lot of acrylic painters use now. She only used water. So it was very interesting. She has the clusters of flowers again. And the idea with the center of the bowl, like I said, most of it either has to be hung, potted or growing. Well, the idea with a plate or center of a bowl like this, where there's just a whole cluster of flowers is you are looking downwards at the top of a bouquet. And the sides, she has that gold band with simple lines that give a rope look. Okay. This is Enid Grinlands. Um, it's again the clusters of flowers. The leaves, the blue leaves, to me are a little more acanthus shape, not so much the Valdris S leaves. But she has uh, parrot tulips in varying shades. She has the small flowers with the twigs and little uh, leaves coming off of them. You see the rose in the very center. Now, if I was doing this, I would have put a little larger rose because that is where your eye goes, goes to basically the root of the design. And I think the parrot tulips kind of overpower that, but some beautiful things in there, okay? And this is Helen Fantel. Um, I, when I first saw this, I'm like, okay, she, did she take a class from me because this looks very much, I could swear this is one of my designs, but I haven't looked back to see. But again, just the clusters of flowers. Um, and when you do roses, I like to vary, not have the exact same rose in all of uh, the roses. Uh, balancing your colors. Uh, these are a few of the um, leaves I use off of roses where actually the leaves are teardrops, a series of teardrops. But even if you do that, you also want somewhere you need to include the S leaves. And this is the Rococo border. Uh, I often paint that with a gel so it's a little more transparent. But if you see it travels around and it's used as a framework for the piece, okay? And this is the sides, which she used the whole um, bottom and 
the edge of the lid as part of the chinoiserie. So she has the antiquing at the top and shaving at the bottom again. And the thing that's interesting with chinoiserie, which means oriental looking, the trees usually were similar to the bonsai shaped trees, or when you go to Japan, you will see how the influence um, has been done in this painting. And the thing that in the painting, usually there is a dead tree, a young tree and a mature tree. And this represented the cycle of life. Okay. Here you can see all the way around the different sides and how the um, chinoiserie flows all the way around. Okay. And this is a very simple tray. The way it was painted is not as much shading. Uh, the varying uh, flowers. What you do notice are those bright red. The very center that whitish rose is painted very lovely, but it gets lost because your eye is always drawn to the reds, the bright colors. So generally when I paint Baldur's, I use red in the very center. But again, you can see the S leaves, the small flowers, the um, twigs. And if you see those little yellow flowers to the right, lower right corner, I've done things like that where you make sort of a round flower and then also like it almost gives a little flute shape shape. Or if you think of those weeds, which have the bottom and the flower coming out of it. Okay. This is Ethel Kalheim's. Um, she has the S leaves as the base, the three flowers, she has roses that are tilting downward and the parrot tulips. Um, the greens, at least in the photo, they look a little dark. They could have been a little brighter just to make it pop more, but it's a very lovely piece, okay? Now this is a piece that I have of Ella Kvalheim's. It's a pagan and she has the chinoiserie around the inside, as you can see here. And I love the larger tree underneath the hole there. Okay. This is the end where you can see there's a rope. And she did a simple border on the upper edge. Okay. And here you can see the flowers that are hanging from the rope the red in the center, um, and then the flowers going outwards and varying sizes of the flowers, okay? This is one of the bowls I did a number of years ago. It was a large bowl, so I put the cluster of flowers in the center and the Rococo uh, border around the upper part, and then the band on the inside, I put the chinoiserie and used the lettering on the outside. But if you could see that cabbage rose in the very center, I always use that cabbage rose in the center. I don't know, I love doing them and it's just what I've done, okay? This is a plate, dark blue, where again, see the cabbage rose. And then I used another rose and different flowers outwards. And because it's dark blue, the dark blue doesn't show up. So I used the green and then I, for the leaves, and then I used the Rococo border. Okay. This is on the brighter blue. Um, when I paint Valdris, I use a Williamsburg blue. If you remember the old Norse blue, some have painted on that, but it's just so dead, so lifeless. It's so grayed and almost greenish. And with the brighter blue, it just pops out much better. Again, I use the cabbage rose. And if you see that blue flower above the two roses, where it's almost striped looking, that's my interpretation of what Peter Adnes did, okay? 
And these are two larger plates that I've done. Often I'll do plates with just a cluster of flowers, but um, if you have something larger, I like to use scrolls as a base for all the flowers. So here I have a main C and one going in the, an S in the opposite direction, the slight S uh, stem for that top rose. And I try to paint my roses in different uh, variations. And also you can use um, like stems of leaves. If you notice on the left, on the right hand side of the left plate, hanging downwards, um, all the S leaves off that get smaller as you go. And twigs with little dot flowers, just again, variations, little details. Okay. This is a small chest I did. Um, the rope again, and the rope is not hard to do. You just take a yellow line, add a dark S stroke, and I add a little light yellow on the top. But it looks harder than it actually is. But again, the cabbage rose is the main focal point. And then I use the leaves made out of teardrops and use the F le S leaves off other flowers and just varying flowers and little leaves and twigs. If you notice the ground, I did a little of the chinoiserie at the base and the mountains behind, okay? This is the lid of it. Again, clusters of flowers and I try to do the, um, roses differently. So I have mainly the two roses and the, I call it sort of a chrysanthemum type flower that are in the center. And then other flowers that have different sizes coming off. Okay. <clears throat> this is a cabinet I had done where the chinoiserie at the bottom, the, um, you can see the stump there. Again, the S leaves with the slight S coming upwards to the cluster of flowers. And there again, I have the same rose. I just always like that rose, okay? Here's, you can see a little better on this side where there's a rope that a cluster of flowers is hanging from and the chinoiserie on the bottom edge. And also inside the door where there's the chinoiserie, and then the Rococo scrolls that I use to kind of fill in the top area. And those I use gel with often just to give more transparency. Okay. That's well, it. I want to say thank you. This is just absolutely a fantastic presentation and a really interesting look at pieces from the collection and from work that you have done and other artists have done. So thank you so much. The chat has been fairly quiet. So, folks, what are you <laughs> wondering? Nancy explained everything so beautifully. Well, that's okay, Andrew. I'll I'll start out with a question. I'll be I'll be brave. So I, I know, yeah, I know, Nancy, that you study and you practice um, other styles too. And as we were going through those slides, you pointed out uh, places where other people had incorporated perhaps some influence or um, other things that they had learned. So in your Valdris painting, have you incorporated um, things that you've learned about or have learned to do in other styles? Um, I guess I just techniques maybe. Um, not so much flowers and things because I started out Rogelin, Telemark, and then I went to Valdris which, yeah, I mean, opposite of <laughs> Rogaland and Telemark, really. So um, one of the most difficult things is using the large filbert and getting that stroke like on those cabbage roses because it looks easy again, but you have to kind of put the paint down and pull quickly and lift up, which for a lot of people, it's hard to do it quickly. <laughs> so you have to be brave. Well, let's Michelle talk a couple of, yeah, I was gonna say, a couple of questions have, have come in here. So 
Um, Kathleen's wondering, is your favorite rose that you that you really like to do, do you paint that first or last on the as you're painting? Actually, I, it depends. If there's something tucked underneath that, um, like you don't see the whole flower, say, for instance, a different style of rose or that um, kind of chrysanthemum type flower, I'll paint those first and then that rose. But mostly I paint those center flowers, then do the leaves off of the, them, and then everything else kind of fits in. Someone is also asking about this slide here, um, wondering if it looks like there's some French influence. Do you think that's something that would have happened in the Valdres style where there would have been the French influence coming in? Oh yeah, um, okay. Peter Adnes especially. Yeah, and like the Rococo was all over. You think of Rococo a lot in the French um, decorations. So the Norwegians actually, they took a lot from Europe and put into their painting. So you can really see the influence, yeah. Yeah, and along along the same lines, wondering about the chinoiserie, you know, coming to to Norway. Do you do you know when that first sort of appeared? I mean, I imagine that you know ideas travel, people travel, they bring these things back, and you're inspired. But perhaps you have more insight into that history. Uh, not really, other than yeah, the traveling and bringing ideas back. Um, I really don't know of a specific date. Um, yeah, unless you have some more information that way. <laughs> I don't happen to. I haven't done a study on that. I don't know if there are a few of you out there, though, I can see that uh, that have done some. So if you have uh, if you have any information about that, feel free to put that into the chat. I'm um, wondering if you know a lot of history about uh, Peter Adnes uh, himself, if he was a guild painter, because his work seems quite sophisticated as if compared to other uh, painters in Baldrus. I really don't know, but he did a lot of work, um, a lot of churches like the church in Bonn, B-A-G-N, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but, um, and a lot of pulpits and things like that. So he was well known. There's a comment from Tina that the shading around the outer edges in a piece really adds a nice quality. And that isn't something that she saw in the earlier pieces. Is that something that you can talk about the history of that? Um, well, like some of the very earlier were more of Ola Berga's style, where it was very simple. Like when I took a class from Ely Salad, we basically used a flat color of paint, very little shading. And like your leaves were an S stroke of green, and then maybe some dirty white on one side and some black on the other. You didn't really mix. Um, so back then, maybe not as much other than with the chinoiserie. And I think it came from the idea of the chinoiserie. Like there is in the Valdres book, if you get a chance to be able to look at that, you'll see some pieces. Um, I think of one cabinet that's in blue specifically and has all these drawers and things, but the sides, they have the ground. So that's, I believe, where more of the shading came in. Because you can see here, um, yeah, all the shading in those panels. And also, you know, now that I see this up here again, one thing I could point out, which you can't see very well in the picture, but on that top um, molding, you'll see there's on the way top, yeah, there's a flower with leaves and smaller things going outward and there's a little bow in between which is just a very lovely detail on the top beautiful 
Uh, Michelle is commenting that so many teachers say use only three colors when rose mulling, but many of the Valdris bouquets have four or more colors. Is is that a normal thing to see in Valdris? Um, well, if you look at this piece that's up, you'll see the whites, the blues, the um, darker reds, the cadmium reds, um, yellows. It doesn't necessarily have to be just three colors in rose mulling, I don't think, as long as everything balances. And when it's a smaller piece, that's where you have to use less colors because you don't have as much room to balance. Um, Baldur's, you see, other than the older pieces, the older pieces, again, you saw a lot of the green leaves, the reddish flowers and the whites and maybe yellow lettering. But in <clears throat> some of the others you found, like Peter Adonis, you found multiple colors. 